Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Zinclea Samoa in for Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, devastated. Breaking overnight, a desperate search growing more dire by the minute. This morning, crews combing through the rubble, racing to find survivors from the pair of powerful earthquakes that devastated parts of Syria and Turkey. Now, thousands of people confirmed dead, with officials warning that death toll could keep rising. We have team coverage on the rescue and recovery efforts, plus what you can do to help. High stakes address this morning, President Biden making his final preparations before tonight's State of the Union to a now divided Congress. More on the message he's set to deliver to Americans and how it could impact how voters feel ahead of the 2024 election. Eye in the sky this morning, the Coast Guard on a mission to help manage the growing migrant crisis off the U.S. coast. We'll give you a bird's eye view at the efforts to rescue people stranded at sea. And chatbot cheaters this morning, a modern age controversy taking shape in America's classrooms over artificial intelligence that can write college level papers in a matter of seconds. More on the concern as schools crack down on plagiarism. That will be an interesting conversation. Yes, and you should know this show not written by ChatGPT. <laughs> By real people. Our team. We yes. love those people. <laughs> but we're beginning this morning in Turkey and Syria, where residents are waking up to more scenes of carnage and devastation following those two powerful earthquakes. The first one is said to be Turkey's biggest in nearly a century. That quake hit the country southeast early Monday. Another struck nearby just hours later. The death toll in both countries now stands at more than 5,000. But the World Health Organization says it could rise to more than 20,000. Overnight, harrowing stories emerged of people trapped under the rubble in freezing temperatures shouting for help as first responders struggle to get through this morning search and rescue teams are battling the cold weather to find more survivors while well, many countries around the world are sending their own crews to help out with the efforts in just a few moments we're going to hear from dr bashir tajaldeen he is the country director for turkey at the syrian american medical society but first let's go to nbc news foreign correspondent Megan Fitzgerald. So, Megan, we are seeing more of these just horrifying pictures coming out of the region. Are emergency crews hopeful they can reach more survivors today? What's the latest in Turkey? Well, Joe, it's good to be with you. Look, this is absolutely a race against time, and we are talking about more than 24 hours that thousands of people have been trapped beneath the rubble. And as you mentioned, uh, we're talking about the depths of winter here, uh, cold temperatures, snow and rain in certain areas. Uh, and, and President Erdogan had said yesterday that that has an impact on first responders. But then, of course, you've got to imagine the people that are trapped beneath the rubble and the impact that that has on them. As you mentioned, I, I think what's most excruciating here, possibly uh, the most most excruciating is the fact that first responders can hear the cries and the screams for help uh, of the people that are trapped, that are desperate to be saved as they work around the clock through these frigid temperatures uh, to try and save them, Joe. You know, Megan, if you go just across the border to Syria, it is in many ways a drastically different situation. I mean, this earthquake yeah. is more heartache for a country that has been hit by years of civil war. So what's the situation like there with so many sanctions and travel restrictions? Can international rescue teams even get there quickly? Look, Joe, you know, it's such a great question, and it absolutely is impacting um, the situation there. I mean, we see the aid that's in Turkey. We know that there's not as much aid uh, in, in Syria right now. But look, uh, we know that the world is, is wanting to help and assist Syria, and that help is on the way. Uh, President Biden, for example, just yesterday saying that U.S. supported humanitarian partners uh, will be going to Syria to try and help out. Uh, we know that the United Kingdom is working and in touch with the United nations about sending help to Syria. Um, we're hearing from the Syrian government, uh, seemingly uh, playing politics, the head of the Syrian Arab Red Crescent saying that Western sanctions are impacting the ability for aid to get through. Um, but the bottom line here is that there is a global response. We are seeing it in action. The world wants to help both the victims of the, the in, in Turkey, uh, along with those in Syria as well, Joe. And speaking of that international response, I mean, we know President Biden spoke with Turkey's president yesterday. What all is the United States offering right now? Yes, yeah, so President Biden uh, further reaffirming his support for Turkey, this dedication to trying to help the country in any way possible. We know that rescue crews are already on the way to uh, 
to Turkey to be there on the ground to try and help with this search and rescue effort. Uh, we know, like we just talked about, you know, we, we are seeing this global response where uh, countries like India, for example, sending medical aid, war-torn Ukraine is also offering help. This is a global response to what is most certainly a humanitarian crisis, Joe. And that says something if Ukraine is offering its help, considering everything that country is going through yeah. right now. Megan, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And for more, we're joined by Dr. Bashir Tajaldeen. He's with the Syrian American Medical Society based in southern Turkey. Doctor, thank you so much for being here. So how are you doing today? And can you take us through what the past 24 hours have been like? Good morning. Uh, uh, thank you for having me today in this interview. Uh, first of all, I would like to hope uh, the mercy for the uh, people passed away in both Turkey and Syria and of the uh, rapid healing for the injured people. Uh, actually, it was uh, a horrible and still horrible uh, situation uh, in both in Turkey and uh, Syria. Uh, still, we are facing uh, a lot of aftershocks. Some of them are mild, some of them are uh, moderate. So uh, still uh, we have some uh, buildings are falling uh, down in both uh, sides. A lot of uh, uh, dead people, you, uh, you heard the uh, number, there are thousands. And tens of thousands are still uh, uh, either injured or under the, uh, the rebels. Uh, the rescue and medical teams are doing uh, uh, their best to uh, uh, to save as much uh, lives as they, uh, as they uh, can. Uh, yeah, uh, personally, I'm lucky to be uh, in Turkey, where there is a, a, a stable government that is responding mm. to uh, to such a crisis. But uh, my deepest uh, uh, feeling, and uh, with my colleagues in uh, Syria. Uh, I, I personally, I'm, I'm following the uh, situation in Syria, mainly in northern Syria, uh, uh, on hourly basis. Me and uh, my colleagues in the uh, in the team, yeah. either here uh, to, uh, the team in Turkey or the team, the medical teams inside Syria. Mm. It's a very uh, terrible situation. We have many of the medical uh, staff who are responding to the injured people in uh, Syria while they are losing their families, their uh, children here in Turkey and the rebels or even uh, in Syria. Our, um, first, uh, our uh, hotels are full of uh, patients and, uh, uh, and injuries and, uh, uh, and dead people. And doctor, you talked about areas of Syria, right? They're already dealing with this ongoing humanitarian crisis. And in massive disasters like this, things can feel very moment to moment. Yeah. I mean, you're joining us from your car. What are some of the biggest challenges you and your organization are facing right now? And how can people who are watching this help? Yes. Actually, you know, in, uh, in Syria, we are facing a crisis uh, since more than one uh, decade where the health facilities and the majority of the infrastructure have been targeted by, by air, air strikes. So the infrastructure already are uh, uh, damaged. And now with this uh, earthquake, we have uh, we we had lost uh, more uh, facilities. For example, yesterday we uh, uh, we evacuated two maternity hospitals because uh, of the damage in the infrastructure. Uh, currently, uh, uh, the very urgent need we uh, uh, we have in Syria is the medical uh, uh, supplies and consumables uh, to treat the mass casualties. We need uh, uh, the uh, support to the medical uh, staff. We are trying to provide as much as we can uh, psychosocial support to the staff are dealing with the uh, injuries. Uh, actually, we also need uh, uh, fuel to operate the, uh, the hospitals and the facilities as uh, uh, because of the earthquake, the electricity is, uh, is cut it, uh, down. So we need mm. to keep the uh, hospitals operated. And also, already we are under uh, substa uh, we have substandard number of uh, inpatient beds for the people in northwest Syria because of the prolonged crisis. So now, more than uh, any time ever, we need to increase the capacity of the uh, of the hospitals to mm. uh, be able to uh, uh, to deal with those uh, patients. 
and also uh, on the other hand we need to deal with the um, other uh, needs rather than the health like the uh, shelter the food uh, items the nfi uh, so all all those sectors have been affected by the earthquake yeah. so currently and very urgently we need uh, medical supplies and increase the capacity of the hospitals we need uh, heating uh, uh, materials to the population we need shelter yes. and we need uh, food Clearly, the need is so high. Doctor, medical, fuel, food, all of it. We're keeping you all in our thoughts and prayers. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. President Biden is gearing up for tonight's State of the Union address. It is the first time the president will face a divided Congress, literally face them, since Republicans took control of the House last month. We've got both the executive and legislative branches covered this morning with NBC News White House correspondent Carol Lee and congressional correspondent Julie Serkin. Carol, let's start with you. President Biden expected to tout some of his biggest, biggest accomplishments from over the last year, but a new Washington Post poll found 62 percent of Americans believe he has not done much well in office. So, I mean, why is there this disconnect with voters and what does he plan to highlight tonight, hoping to try and break through that? Well, it's a great question because this is a huge challenge for the president, Joe. And one of the things that we're going to see him try to do tonight, according to White House officials, is to go through the highlights reel of his presidency so far. So he's going to talk about all of the things that he has signed into law with an emphasis on some of those laws that got bipartisan support. So, for instance, the infrastructure law and a CHIPS Act that's designed to manufacture semiconductors here in, in the United States. And so what what the president's going to do is try to make this case that he's been doing a lot of things because, as you noted, Americans aren't a feeling this in terms of the economic benefits, and they don't really know what he's done. And so this is an opportunity, the largest audience the president's going to get all year, and he will lay out what he's done so far. At the same time, he's going to also call for some new policies. Among those include expanding this insulin cap that Democrats passed that benefits Medicaid recipients. They want that to expand more broadly, voting rights, um, other issues that they would like to address. However, those are things that Democrats couldn't do on their own when they had control of both houses of Congress. So now all of that is just a little bit harder. So the president will try to make headway on things that he's already done in terms of Americans understanding them and feeling the benefits from them, and at the same time call for some new policies. So Julie, I mean, we know foreign policy is going to be featured tonight. Ukraine was a major topic in last year's address. How much do you think we're going to hear about Ukraine tonight as we prepare to mark one year since the start of the war? And also, is the president going to address the growing issue over this suspected Chinese spy balloon? Yeah, Joe. Well, look, to Carol's point, the, the issue of China and Ukraine are perhaps the two issues that the president could get done in Congress in these next two years with the divided government because support for Ukraine uh, was really strong, of course, during the last State of the Union, just days after Russia invaded Ukraine. And the First Lady today also bringing uh, the Ukrainian ambassador to the U.S. as one of her guests tonight. So this really sets the stage for what President Biden is going to emphasize. And after uh, the U.S., including Congress, passing over $100 billion since the start of the war uh, to Ukraine, the many critics think and hope and expect that the president uh, will make this a focus and revive support uh, for the war-torn country as we hit that one-year mark, especially as uh, support dwindles among Republicans in Congress. And of course, China, in light of this Chinese balloon, after the weekend, the president uh, tweaking some remarks ahead of tonight this is one of the areas of bipartisan cooperation as well. We saw a China committee launched in the House, and lawmakers are expected to get briefed on this situation in the coming days. And Julie, another major issue looming over the Biden administration is the debt ceiling and the president's relationship with the House Speaker McCarthy. The president's going to be standing before this newly empowered GOP-controlled House. I mean, quickly here, how does that dynamic influence the president's speech tonight? Yes, standing before the new Republican majority with the Speaker uh, McCarthy sitting over his shoulder. And McCarthy uh, gave a 10-minute speech last night, a rare a scripted speech on the debt ceiling. This comes just days after he met with the president in the Oval Office, really urging uh, spending negotiations, spending cuts uh, for debt ceiling raise. And it is all his hope and Republicans hope that the president will take his time today to say that that is possible. But as we've learned in the lead up to this from our White House colleagues, including Carol, uh, the president is going to, of course, 
stick to their position of no negotiations over the debt ceiling. And this is something uh, Republicans are hoping that he will bring bipartisan cooperation on. All right, Julie Serkin and Kara Lee with a preview of the State of the Union. Thank you both. And with more on the State of the Union, we're joined now by David Litt, former speechwriter for President Obama and New York Times bestselling author. David, good morning. Thank you for being with us. So we've been here before, but remind us, what is the significance of a State of the Union address? Well, thank you for having me this morning. And the State of the Union address is a very strange speech because on one hand, it is one of the, if not the sort of premier presidential speech of the year. On the other hand, it's a real challenge because often it ends up becoming uh, longer than anyone would like, and it can become kind of a laundry list that's, you know, every year you'll hear that phrase, laundry list of policies, um, and it's hard to find a, a backbone to that speech. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's also a big opportunity for a president and a White House because this is a very rare moment, even in this Internet era where we can all watch clips of our politicians talking. This is a moment when tens of millions of Americans are going to tune in hear directly from the president and hear him lay out his agenda for the coming year. That doesn't happen very often. Uh, and so this is still a big night for the president and for the White House. And David, to your point, right, it doesn't happen often. This is just President Biden's second address. How have, how have past presidents approached their second State of the Union address compared to their first? Well, I think the biggest difference this State of the Union is that this is the first time when President Biden is not going to have a Democrat behind him in the chair occupied by the Speaker of the House. You're going to have Kevin McCarthy. And I think one of the most interesting things about this speech is not actually what President Biden is going to do. I suspect he's going to continue to do what presidents always do, laying out his agenda, making clear his priorities. We're going to have to see what the audience does. Um, we saw the last time you know, most Americans were watching the, the floor of Congress was when Republicans spent days trying to figure out who they were going to elect Speaker of the House. It was you know, it looked like it was a bunch of adults behaving like children over there. And the question now is, are the is the Republican caucus going to be able to hold itself together? Are they going to be able to sit still for 60 minutes and behave like, you know, not like uh, Democrats? They're not necessarily going to applaud the president, but are they going to be able to ha behave respectfully like public officials? Or are we going to see yet another sign that the Republican caucus is just not able to to handle this new responsibility that it won in the last election? And David, I wonder for you as a former speechwriter, how challenging can it be to strike that balance? You talked about the laundry list that the State of the Union can become. So how do presidents strike the balance between fact and fiction, talking about accolades while also issues that many Americans are dealing with? I think when you look at the State of the Union, and this was always kind of a, a discussion in the speechwriting office when I was there, it is a real struggle because this is one of those speeches where you do have a lot of priorities to talk about. You can't say, okay, well, we'll just focus on one thing. There's lots of important things facing the country, and the president has to talk about those things. I think what speechwriters are looking for is a through line or a backbone to the speech, some major point. And I think here, my, my suspicion is what you'll see is that President Biden will frame this speech as uh, sort of a, a um, halfway point in his term. So he's gonna talk about what he accomplished during the first two years and then what that means going forward. And I think this is going to be the beginning of, uh, you know, the last two years were very legislatively successful with Democrats controlling Congress. The next two years, I think President Biden's gonna be implementing and also trying to explain and sell those accomplishments. All right, David Litt, thank you so much for that. And you can watch President Biden's State of the Union address tonight right here on NBC News Now. Our coverage starts at 8 p.m. Eastern. Now to the latest developments involving the suspected Chinese surveillance balloon, which was shot down off the Carolina coast. U.S. officials are revealing new details about the balloon and how they were able to track it as it moved across the country. NBC News Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent Andrea Mitchell has the latest details. The head of U.S. Northern Command says the 10-square-mile debris field from the Chinese surveillance balloon has been narrowed to less than a square mile. The Coast Guard setting up a security zone around the crash site, with the military saying the balloon was 200 feet tall, with a payload weighing more than 2,000 pounds. The president taking a hard line against China, which today escalated its attacks, saying it reserved the right to retaliate against the U.S. We made it clear to China what we're going to do. They understand our position. We're not going to back off. We did the right thing. The goal now, analyze the wreckage to determine what information China was able to learn and whether it was using new technology. We were also able to ensure 
the protection of any sensitive information that the balloon would not be able to collect against us because we knew exactly where it was going before it got there. Two senior administration officials tell NBC News U-2 spy planes were circling the balloon as it crossed the country, taking pictures and extracting data about the Chinese capability. There's immense intelligence value in watching an asset like this actually behave. What are its maneuverability, its collection, its emission characteristics? But the White House is facing questions on Capitol Hill. Members of Congress on both sides of the aisle have some serious questions about how long they knew about this, why they didn't shoot it down sooner, what information, if any, was able to be collected. China still denying it was a spy mission. This is a major unforced error and a blunder by China. It was a massive setback for their intelligence collection program. And I think globally around the world, we can be talking about China's invasion of sovereignty. Our thanks to Andrea Mitchell for that report. And to put this incident in perspective, the last time the U.S. shot down another country's aircraft in our airspace was during World War II in Pearl Harbor. Now for a check on your morning news now weather forecast. Angie Lastman is with us. Good morning, Angie. Good morning, guys. We're tracking our next front that's going to bring some potentially problematic and even dangerous weather to folks in, in the south. We'll start with that. Here's what's going on. You can see right now satellite and radar doesn't look like much. We have a little bit of rain working through Oklahoma City into St. Louis and stretching into parts of Texas. That's basically going to be the area that we see uh, mostly impacted through the late parts of your day today. There's the system that we're tracking to the east. It looks like the timing of this is going to be later into the day. Uh, and into the overnight hours and then into tomorrow. So this is kind of a two-day event where we'll watch for the potential again for some of these storms to strengthen and leave us with severe potential. Here's what it looks like as we get into tomorrow. We'll see it up into the Tennessee Valley stretching down into the Gulf Coast and then again we'll continue to see that track to the east and we'll make some improvements as far as our forecast for folks in the Gulf Coast in places like Texas. But the next two days you got to be on guard. Here's the area that we're watching today. The, the um, impacts are limited today. Not all that Impressive, but still they do include places like Houston, Corpus Christi. We could see a tornado or two possible again later into the evening hours, into the overnight. We know those nocturnal uh, tornadoes are always the most dangerous, so we won't rule out that potential. And wind gusts could be up to 60 miles per hour. Notice that we add the yellow in. That means that the potential is a little higher for us to see some of this uh, severe weather, and there will be 6 million people included in that. So we're more likely to see these damaging wind gusts, the hail, and several tornadoes will be possible. That does include places like Lake Charles, New New Orleans and Jackson. So just be aware of that. Rainfall could be heavy at times and localized flooding is not out of the question. Up to four inches of rain in some spots. Again, that does include a flash flood potential for places like Dallas and up into Fort Smith. So just be aware of that into tomorrow. And if you live in the east, boy, is it warm. Temperatures are well above normal. Some spots like Nashville running 17 degrees above where it should be for this time of year. Cleveland at 50 degrees today, 57 for Cincinnati. Guys, uh, it feels like spring out there and I have a feeling that people maybe in the Northeast over as we get through the next couple of days might be wearing shorts outside. I yes. know I'm going to see uh -oh. it. Yeah, I think you're right. In Minnesota, we wear shorts usually around 30 degrees. Michigan so, too? Yeah. Cannot there really. Yep. So, Cannot all really. right. We'll, we'll take pictures the first yes. time you see it. All right. Andrew thank you, Lassman. Angie. Thank you. Coming up first, a derailment, now a detonation. Up next, how officials in Ohio are working to prevent a toxic explosion at the site of a train wreck with hazardous materials on board. Also, crisis on the coast will give you a bird's eye look at how the Coast Guard is dealing with an influx of migrants stranded at sea. You're watching Morning News Now. Welcome back. In Ohio, officials have reduced the risk of an explosion at the site of a freight train derailment in East Palestine yesterday. They carried out a controlled chemical release on vehicles believed to be carrying hazardous materials. NBC News correspondent Ron Allen has the details. Emergency crews desperately trying to get control of a potentially deadly situation with a controlled detonation. For three days, warning residents the burning wreckage of a freight train could explode, sending shrapnel and toxic fumes a mile in every direction over a rural Ohio community. It's kind of crazy for a small town like this. Thousands of residents under a mandatory evacuation order, police going door to door, threatening families with children with arrest if they don't leave. Police car came up and said, evacuate, evacuate, evacuate now, get out, get out. Friday night, as many as 50 of the train's 150 cars derailed en route from Illinois to Pennsylvania. 
The response focused on five cars carrying hundreds of thousands of pounds of vinyl chloride used to make PVC pipes and vehicle upholstery and also linked to increased risk of cancer, according to the CDC. This is a matter of life and death. This controlled release will actually take place and you are in imminent danger. Officials again warning residents to stay away as they use small explosives to blow holes in the train cars, hoping the hazardous material will seep into ditches where it can be burned safely away. We want to be able to control that situation. That's the safest way is to control the situation, and that's with this operation we're going to take this afternoon. Railroad officials now saying that operation was a success. The hazardous material burning itself off, apparently easing the threat to this community as residents await word that it's safe to go back home. Ron Allen, NBC News, Columbiana, Ohio. Ron, thank you so much. In Florida, the Coast Guard is working around the clock to manage the ongoing surge of migrants who are arriving by sea. The Coast Guard is looking for vessels trying to make it to the U.S. shore. They're also searching for stranded migrants who need help. NBC News correspondent Guad Venegas was embedded with the Coast Guard and saw one of those rescues firsthand. They are the eyes in the sky over thousands of miles of open water on a mission to save and intercept. The U.S. Coast Guard granting NBC News access to one of their planes, cameras documenting how they patrol the ocean. Within the first hour, flying over a group of migrants stranded on an island near the Bahamas, floating nearby two empty vessels. Cameras and radars on the plane are used to spot the vessels before we can actually look at them. Then other officers will look out the window and actually be able to see them out here. This group of migrants brought on board to a Coast Guard cutter. It's all part of an ongoing surge in migration headed to the Florida coastline. The U.S. Coast Guard says more than 8,000 migrants have been interdicted on water in the Florida sector since October. This vessel carrying over 300 migrants crowded on a sailboat. The surge prompting Governor Ron DeSantis to declare a state of emergency, making additional resources available, including the National Guard. The majority of the migrants coming from Cuba and Haiti, often with limited supplies. Most of the migrants found at sea will be repatriated by the Coast Guard, but policing the waters means also bringing humanitarian support for what can often become a deadly voyage. We had a case a couple of weeks ago where we found people on uh, Nankia, the island we flew over earlier. They had written SOS in the sand, and I had happened to see it while we were flying by, and we were able to drop them food, water, a radio so they could talk to us, and we could let them know, hey, you know, we're going to have people coming to get you, and they were picked up within two hours. But the surge in numbers continues, and the vessels seen at sea are a proof of the desperation. A lot of these vessels are very homemade, and in that way, they're very unseaworthy. So I've seen vessels that have motors to literally a paddleboard with suitcases on the side of it with three people um, just trying to hopefully drift up towards the United States. Um, and I think that's the really scary thing for us is because these vessels are so unseaworthy, you know, we don't know how long they're going to last. Yet even with air support and technology, the mission to find all illegal vessels is virtually impossible. Florida state authorities say at least 5,400 migrants have been apprehended after making it to U.S. soil illegally since October of last year. Last week, DHS Secretary Mayorkas speaking to Jose Diaz Vallard, sending a message to those migrants. People who take to the sea will not be eligible for the parole process. For the U.S. Coast Guard, the mission continues. When our airplane lands, another goes in the sky. Our thanks to Guad Venegas for that report. The Biden administration announced the humanitarian parole program in early January. Under these new regulations, Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans can apply for a two-year parole period, allowing them to travel legally to the U.S., but they must have a financial sponsor. Coming up on Morning News Now, new life-changing technology for millions who are suffering from a common symptom of long COVID. Up next, more on how researchers are working to give people their sense of smell back. And air pollution causing problems for more than just the air. The new research linking pollutants to your mood and what you can do to clear the air.
Welcome back. A recent study published in the medical journal, the BMJ, says that nearly 15 million adults worldwide experience long-term smell loss because of COVID. That's right. And two researchers in Virginia may have come up with a solution to this smelly problem. NBC News medical fellow Dr. Akshay Sayal tells us more about this exciting new technology. Craig Jerome. A nurse practitioner in North Carolina lost his sense of smell after he got COVID two years ago. In the initial onset, you you had the overwhelming sensation of, I've lost it, and when is it coming back? You know, unfortunately, it's never came back to me the way it used to be. Today, he still can't smell properly. How has your life been affected personally as, as a result of not being able to smell as well? I think just looking at it and going, you know, what did I enjoy and what do I miss? I think it's a grief moment in, in a sense that, you know, you go through it and you long to be the way you were. Jerome is one of more than 15 million estimated adults worldwide suffering from long-term loss of smell due to COVID, according to research published by medical journal The BMJ last July. But two scientists at the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine might have a solution. They're developing a bionic nose. The whole idea is that for individuals who have lost their sense of smell, if you can bypass the damaged area of the system, you can restore the sense of smell. Dr. Richard Costanza and Dr. Daniel Coelho are developing the new medical technology. Here's how it works. A small sensor that can detect smells is placed on something like a pair of glasses. That sensor would then send signals to a chip implanted in the brain. The chip then stimulates parts of the brain that process smells. A series of sensors that detect smell molecules and each smell is going to have a different pattern. Depending on that pattern, a different way of stimulating the brain is done and the end result is that the patient can appreciate different smells. An early prototype showed promising results. Researchers identified electrical patterns in the brains of rats, suggesting they were processing smells. These doctors have been working on this problem long before COVID started. When you've been working in the field for 30, 40 years and struggling to find solutions that can be translated to clinical trials, it's very rewarding to be at this point in time. They say it will take five to 10 years for a prototype to be ready. But for those who can't smell, the device would change lives. After all, being able to smell can save your life. Think about a gas leak or a fire and smelling something like homemade cookies can bring joy. The sense of smell is very closely linked to memory, to mood, to cognition, more than almost any other sense, you can you can smell something and instantly be transported back 40 years to a memory that you that hadn't thought about. And for Jerome, even the simplest joys of life without smell have lost their luster. And you hug someone that you love and you hadn't been around in a while, and you can't get that full experience of you know wrapping your arms around them and and smelling that that essence that they have, and it's it's theirs to their own degree. You just can't, you can't get that um, like you used to. So that embrace and that reminder is not there. For those who've lost their sense of smell, the bionic nose can't come soon enough. Our thanks to Dr. Akshay Sayal for that report. And it is important to add that the creators say they're using microelectronics and computer processing, including artificial intelligence, to build their bionic nose. Time now for our weekly mental health check-in. Depression and anxiety may be fogging your brain, and new research suggests that air pollution could be the culprit. Yeah, plus we have tips on how to approach conversations about the recent death of Tyree Nichols with children. Let's bring in Dr. Somia Dave for more on these mental health headlines. She is a psychiatrist and author of What a Happy Family. Doctor, always good to have you with us. So let's start with this new research published in JAMA Psychiatry. It found people who are exposed to relatively low levels of air pollutants have a higher chance of experiencing depression and anxiety. So walk us through the link here, and is there any way we can actually lower our exposure to these pollutants? Sure. So what we're seeing is that the particles in pollution can lead to increased stress and inflammation in the brain, and that can lead to increased mental health challenges. Now, the study in JAMA Psychiatry looked at 400,000 adults in the UK, and it found that the ones who were the least exposed to air pollution had the least likelihood of having depression and anxiety. There's still a lot of research exploring the nuances in this dynamic and what all might be playing into it. But for anyone interested in decreasing pollution, pollution exposure, there's some tips. So one, 
can you substitute your car use on certain days if you do use a car regularly for another mode of transportation like walking or a bike ride? Can you increase your time spent in green spaces, which we've talked about on this segment before, how beneficial that can be? Can you have a filter for indoor and outdoor air to really make sure that your home doesn't have as much of that polluted outdoor air? And I have seen suggestions for considering, considering an electric car, but I do want to emphasize that that might not be financially feasible for many people. It's really important to remember that we can do a lot as individuals, but we will also need policy changes so that we can feel supported in making these changes. Mm, and doctor, I want to ask you also about children. I know the recent death of Tyree Nichols renewed conversations about police brutality and race and the spread of disturbing images, particularly those of death. So for parents, it can be hard to talk about these issues in general, let alone with kids. What are the best ways to approach these topics with children, if at all? And is there a difference with teenagers? This can be so tough, and we have to remember that children of our, all ages are taking in information, they're taking in the news, and it can be traumatic. And so I do encourage parents, if their kids come to them telling them they have seen something, to really have open-ended conversations and to ask questions like, what did you see? How did it impact you? What did it make you feel? and really exploring and validating the array of emotional responses that may have come up for kids. Also for parents, I think it's really helpful to have our own mental health check-ins before having these conversations mm. to make sure that we're in a space to really explore these dynamics with kids. We have to tackle this last one fairly quickly, but we're gonna take a trip to Sesame Street. That's where Elmo and Rosita are sharing a new message with military families. Tell us why this is so important and what it is they're doing here. I love this. So this is a digital series that explores emotional well-being. And what it really does is it integrates self-care and emotional wellness into daily activities. And we've talked about the benefits of that here before, but we know that people need support. There was a survey done between Bloom and the National Family Military Alliance, and it showed that over 40% of responders ages 13 to 19 had some signs of emotional distress. So we know that we need more support. We know that we need more avenues for self-care. And this provides a way to do that with loved ones and in a context that feels familiar and fun and loving for so many people. All right. Always fun to take a trip to Sesame Street. Yeah. Dr. Somi <laughs> Dali, as always, thank you. Appreciate your time this thank morning. You. Coming up, money matters. Record inflation on the minds of many Americans. Now, President Biden expected to talk about the economy in tonight's State of the Union. Up next, what the president's economic record could tell us about his strategy going forward. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. President Biden is preparing to lay out the roadmap for the rest of his term in his State of the Union address tonight. And as we mentioned earlier, he's likely going to highlight his economic policy victories. Everything from inflation on the decline to strong job growth and low unemployment numbers. So let's dig into the president's economic record and where he goes from here. Joining us is NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung. Brian, let's start with the job market here. The economy is seeing some strong job growth and low unemployment right now. That's good news. And just last week, we saw better than expected jobs report numbers. So walk us through how the jobs market looked when Biden first took office and where things stand now. Yeah, let's take a look at the numbers since inauguration in Ju uh, January of 2021. We can see it's been a pretty sharp fall in terms of the unemployment rate. It was actually much higher. It was 14% during the depths of the pandemic, during the tail end of the Trump administration, went down to 6.3%. Basically, since then, it's continued to go down a lot. This associated with the economic reopening, leisure and hospitality, bars and restaurants reopening was a big reason for this drop. But what's really interesting is that it hasn't gone up. And that was the expectation as the Federal Reserve started to hike interest rates in 2022. Instead, what happened? The unemployment rate actually continued to drift down. And as of the last read that we got just on Friday, the U.S. economy at a 3.4% unemployment rate. Guys, you would have to rewind to 1969 to see an unemployment rate that low. So certainly a good state of the unemployment market and the labor market headed into the State of the Union. So, Brian, in the president's last State of the Union address, he set a goal of lowering prices for consumers. Spoiler alert, that didn't happen. What followed was a year of historic inflation with levels not seen in decades. It peaked last summer, gradually declining since then. So remind us what happened there. Do economists see this as a lasting turnaround, especially as we try to avoid what could or could not be a recession coming up? Yeah, and that's what makes this economy so weird because look, the labor market looks really good, but you know what doesn't look good? This, this is the chart showing year over year paces of inflation since uh, Biden took office in January, 2021, and you can see 
it's been elevator up, right? We were actually below 2% as the Trump administration turned over to the Biden administration, skyrocketed up. Now, a lot of this was due to the demand that Americans were doing as they went out and bought things and sought services as the economy reopened. But another big story here was specifically beginning in 2021, we started to hear about those supply chain snags, right? Lots of issues with factories not being open around the world. And then also, you remember actually the Suez Canal boat getting jammed up. That was in March of 2021. So it peaked at around 9.1%. That was the year pace of inflation that we saw, but it has been coming down, again, thanks to the Federal Reserve's efforts to raise borrowing costs, which they hope will discourage people from spending as much and firms from investing as much. That has led to the inflation rate falling to about 6.5% as of the last read, but the economy really is a lot healthier if it's somewhere closer to 2%. So the job is not done. The Biden administration has said they're going to let the Federal Reserve do its part on that. That's the reason why they're signaling that further interest rate hikes are likely. And Brian, briefly here, from an economic standpoint, where does the government stand on its budget deficit and the federal debt ceiling? Yeah, that's going to be a big focus in the State of the Union today because of the concern over perhaps not paying our bills. Again, as a reminder, the debt ceiling covers any sort of payments that have already been made, but it just seeks to pay off the debt that we have. There's been no agreement so far, and the expectation is that June 5th is going to be the day when uh, the economy runs out of money. Sorry, my writing is not so great here, but June, <laughs> June 5th is the day that apparently will run out of money to pay our bills. Until then, the Treasury can turn to these extraordinary measures to get through early June. But reminder, Congress has moved 78 times to raise this debt ceiling. Hopefully, they can make it 79 times this time as well. Mm, Brian, bringing us the latest and greatest. Thank you. And some great handwriting there, too. <laughs> All right, let's keep the money news going. Google gearing up to launch its own chatbot service. CNBC's Pippa Stevens joins us now for more money news. Good morning, Pippa. Good morning. Well, Google is launching a chatbot and more artificial intelligence features as it battles with Microsoft in the new wave of computing. Google's CEO says the company is opening up a conversational AI service called BARD to test users. It will be released to the public in the coming weeks. BARD is designed to explain complex subjects, such as outer space, in terms that are easy enough for a child to understand. Microsoft is investing billions of dollars into OpenAI, the maker of ChatGPT, and announced it's holding a special event for later today. Meantime, Tinder is rolling out new safety features. You can now use incognito mode where only people you like will see you in their recommendations. You can also block profiles that pop up in your suggestions. Tinder has also updated the Are You Sure and Does This Bother You feature to detect more language in a conversation that may be harmful or inappropriate. And a lot of people plan to wager on the big game this weekend. A survey out today from American Gaming Association finds 50 million Americans plan to bet on the Super Bowl, up more than 60% from last year. They expect to bet a combined $16 billion, which is double the amount of legal bets last year. The huge increase comes as sports books such as DraftKings and FanDuel are seeing a major expansion in legalization and adoption by consumers. The survey also finds a third of NFL fans say sports betting makes watching games more exciting. At least I have until Sunday to figure out who to root for. Not at the betting stage just yet. Still choosing the team. Just, just in your heart. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Peppa. Thank you. And coming up, schools hoping to outsmart artificial intelligence. When we come back here on Morning News Now, the new concerns over chatbots and cheating in the classroom. Welcome back. It is a week until Valentine's Day. And if you decided that your pet is the one who has won your heart, at least for right now, well, one company has you covered. Fancy Feast is launching a limited edition Cuddle Collection, a line of products just for cats and their owners to celebrate February 14th. Inside the $62 set is a cozy cat ear sweater for extra soft cuddles, embroidered socks, a custom wine glass to cheers your friendship, and snacks and heart-shaped toys for your favorite feline companion. It comes after the brand conducted a survey that found one in five cat owners preferred to spend the day with their furry friends over their significant other. If you are the human one in this relationship, you will want to order your own dinner, <laughs> though. Duly noted, I, I don't have a pet, but this kind of makes me want one. <laughs> <laughs> or just Joke. get the sweater. You know. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yep. Finally, this hour, we've been hearing about ChatGPT and how it can write everything from poems to jokes to college-level essays. Some teachers are calling for it to be banned in classrooms, but others are embracing it. NBC News technology correspondent Jake Ward explains. 
Hey there. Generative AI, this kind of AI that basically predicts what the next word should be in a text string, is so powerful that at this point students across the world are already using it to do their work for them. That of course is causing enormous panic. But among some teachers, including one I spoke to in rural Oregon, it's perhaps a new teaching tool that they're just figuring out how to use. In rural Rogue River, Oregon. It's not going to go away. Kelly Gibson's AP literature students are discussing artificial intelligence. What I would like to see you guys do in this discussion is really be able to kind of vet how you feel about this. She's talking about ChatGBT, the new bot that can spit out college level essays in seconds and has passed graduate level medical, legal, and business exams. School districts like New York City's are banning it. What was your reaction when you first encountered ChatGPT? Uh, my first reaction was absolutely panic. But now, this 25 year veteran of teaching is embracing it. In one new lesson, students had to read a book, then write a thesis statement to plug into ChatGPT. It spit out an essay, which they then worked from. If it's introduced to them, not through the lens of being a cheating tool, and instead through the lens of being something that will help them, we have a better chance further down the road of them seeing it that mm. way. In a recent survey of 1,000 college-age students, more than half said they have used ChatGPT to write a school essay. It was good writing. One of philosophy professor Darren so Hicks' students her, even admitted it. I just told her, I don't think you wrote this essay. Can you tell me who or what did? And at that point, she named chat GPT. So the student gets an F in my class. I'm, I'm pretty draconian about these things. It's the same punishment Hick has always given in cases of plagiarism, but this essay was different. Normally, a plagiarized essay is screaming its own nature at you. But in this case, it wasn't. Which is why there's now a race to create tools to spot AI writing. The makers of ChatGPT recently announced a detector, but even they say it's not always accurate. Turnitin is a tech company whose software helps thousands of colleges and high schools fight plagiarism. They what say they'll have an AI, AI spotter ready in a few months. Our AI is fully capable of understanding which pieces of an essay feel more like AI writing and which pieces are not. And while ChatGPT's bland writing style is easy to spot now, I think we should expect that they'll get more sophisticated, that their word choices become spicier, mm. less vanilla. Back in Kelly Gibson's class, opinions are divided. It is a good comparison to a calculator. Calculators can do it all. You type in anything and it'll figure it out, but we still learn math. I'm a student, so I love it. But if I was a teacher, I would not let it. I wouldn't use it in my class. <laughs> oh, yeah. But Gibson says her um, students are teaching out, her something. I see the students wanting to use it for good, at least so far. It's so new. They want to figure out how it becomes a tool in their lives. A tool she hopes they use, not to cheat, like but to learn. Now, of course, it's important to understand here that whole companies exist that use AI to basically rewrite plagiarized text to make it undetectable. There are millions, perhaps billions of dollars to be made off that kind of thing. And so it's not clear yet whether, although we can agree that education should be a process and not a product, education is in fact going to survive this transformative piece of technology and all the pressures it's going to put on us. Jake, fascinating reporting on the it's future of writing. Big talker right uh -huh. now. All right, that does it for this <laughs> hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.